Right. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome back, I guess. So uh, we're happy to have Leonard this week uh, telling us about periodic versions of algebraic K theory, if I remember correctly. Right. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak in the seminar. Um, before, because this uh, series of seminar talks by people from Utrecht is also always a little bit about kind of what we do, not more, not only about the math. I just want to spend kind of the first, uh, I don't know, three minutes kind of saying a little bit like what I usually do and uh, later will maybe uh, become clear how this uh, topic of my talk fits into this. So generally I'm, um, so mostly I do topology and uh, particular thing called homotopy theory and depending on whom you ask, uh, this is part of topology or not. Some people have uh, pretty heated opinions about this. Uh, and uh, I always also do a little bit of arithmetic geometry. So, so roughly I would say I'm, uh, if I make a scale, uh, I would say I'm at uh, say 90% uh, topology homotopy theory, 10% arithmetic geometry. Um, and so in arithmetic geometry, kind of to topics which interest me most are kind of moduli of elliptic curves. And uh, almost necessarily also a bit uh, about modular forms then. And there are things on the left-hand side on topology, which have a lot to do with them called topological modular forms. And uh, there's also another thing which is almost the same called elliptic cohomology. So in this talk, I will say nothing about what this is. I only want to say that I, uh, this is kind of one of the main things I work with. And so I also sometimes study these things as well. And um, in some sense, this is a um, sub part of an area called chromatic homotopy theory. And uh, on the right hand side, I could also write something about the moduli of formal groups. Um, this would be also related uh, to this chromatic homotopy theory on the left hand side. So often I like to study things in homotopy theory topology, which are related to some things uh, which have something to do maybe with arithmetic geometry. Okay. So today I will talk about periodic versions. of algebraic K theory. So, uh, so at a later stage, I will report in this talk about some joint work I get, did with Markus Lund, Aki Matthew and Georg Tamme. Um, but so my basic plan is I first want to give an introduction to algebraic K theory. Then I will introduce kind of the simplest version of these periodic uh, versions of algebraic K theory. And at the end, I will say a little bit, if time permits, what this has to do uh, with chromatic homotopy theory, where um, there would be the really new part of my joint work with uh, Marcus, Georg, and Akio. Uh, but let's see uh, how time passes. Okay. So um, before I want to say anything about algebraic K theory, I want to quickly recall something about topological K theory or for people who don't know it, I want to quickly introduce it um, because this might be more familiar. So, so say we have a compact house of space, X. So one can define its K theory K of X in two steps. So the first one is consider uh, isomorphism classes of complex vector bundles.
So vector bundles, for example, like the tension bundle of a manifold. Uh, I guess a complex manifold in this case. Um, and uh, note that I, uh, by default, I always assume that things are finite dimensional. So vector bundles will assume to be finite dimensional. And uh, so what can I do if I have two vector bundles? If I have two vector bundles, E and F, I can consider the direct sum. And uh, this makes uh, vect C into an abelian monoid. So what does abelian monoid mean? We have a uh, binary operation, in this case direct sum, which is commutative, associative, has a neutral element, namely the zero vector bundle, but doesn't have inverses, or a priori not necessarily. And in this case, actually nothing except for the zero vector bundle has an inverse. Um, so, but the K theory will be a group associated to X. So, so we need to have a, a second uh, construction. So given an abelian monoid, uh, we can form its group completion. Uh, denoted by M group. So this is also sometimes called the Groten deconstruction because Groten was the first one who introduced this. Uh, and so I just want to say it informally. So elements are formal differences. M minus N, where M and N are in M. And then we have to put a relation on this, namely that M plus Q minus N plus Q is M minus N. So in some sense, uh, we do the minimal thing to make uh, the Sibelian monoid into a group. Namely, uh, I mean, for every uh, element, we also need to consider its inverse to make it into a group. And so a general element would be of the form M plus an inverse of some element, so M minus N. And uh, strictly speaking, I would construct it as a I have pairs of elements and then quotient of a certain equivalence relation. Okay. And the example would be, uh, the easiest example would be if I take the natural numbers with zero and group completed, I get the integers. So this is essentially like the textbook definition of the integers. So, but note, uh, so note, I have a morphism from M to group completion is not, not injective in general. Um, so this is one of the ways, uh, the kind of this whole group completion stuff can simplify something. So, uh, oh, maybe I should say before I say this, K of X is now defined to be the group completion. So, um, so this is simpler than understanding Vec C of X in two ways. First of all, working with groups is much more convenient than working with monoids. And second of all, some of the uh, nasty elements here would just disappear in the K theory. So for example, an example where we had real vector bonds instead of complex would be with tangent bundle of a sphere. Uh, we can add a one dimensional trivial bundle to get a trivial bundle because it's a normal bundle of the sphere. And uh, so tangent bundle plus one dimensional trivial bundle is a trivial bundle of dimension N plus one, but of course trivial n-dimensional bundle plus one-dimensional trivial is also trivial n plus one-dimensional. So we can just, uh, uh, this implies that the tension bundle in the K-theory class would be just a trivial bundle. So something simplify. Okay. So we throw out some information, but we can much easier work with these kind of groups. And I also say that to be precise, I should write K0 here because they're also uh, K groups in other degrees, and so I want to put the zero here. So, any questions so far about the topological K theory part? Well, your example used real bundles. Yeah, so I cheated. 
but I could complexify uh, any wheel bundle to get a complex vector bundle. But I find uh, wheel bundles, uh, I mean, complex bundles are easier to work with, but wheel bundles are somehow, somehow a little bit more intuitive, maybe. Okay. So now there's a classic theorem by Sea and Swan. which is a way making vector bundles algebraic. Namely, turns out that vector bundles uh, on X can be identified with isomorphism classes of projective modules over the ring of continuous uh, functions. So to be more precise, and I guess I should write not equal, but isomorphic. Precise is a continuous C valued functions, which are ring by pointwise multiplication. And this thing here is uh, isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective modules. So, where projective module is a summand of a free module. Okay. So this is a very nice theorem. Uh, and this somehow says that projective modules um, should be the general analog of vector bundles, even if we don't have this ring, but another ring. So it's natural if we want to have a kind of generalized K-theory to make the following definition. Let R be a ring. Then we define K zero of R to be, take the projective modules of R and then group complete. And I write zero here as I wrote also zero here. And why do I write zero down here and I wrote zero up here? because uh, vector bundles are actually a contravariant functor uh, of the uh, space, while projective modules are covariant functor. So this is why I use this convention. Okay, so let's give some simple examples. So say I have some field. Well, I know that every projective module over a field is actually free. So this means that uh, proj of a field is in bijection with the natural numbers, sending n to the field to the n. So uh, this group completion is then the integers. And actually, I don't need to take a field. I can also take k0 of the integers the same argument, every projective module over the integers is free. So, uh, but uh, this is not true in general. So for example, if uh, OF is a number ring, so a ring of integers in a number field. So, and if you don't know what this is, think of something like we take the integers and it joins some root of some polynomial. So easiest one specific case might be we take, uh, we just adjoin a square root of minus five, or could to square root of any element or much more general. So then K zero of our F is isomorphic to Z. So the Z th thing I have always from the free modules plus a thing called the class group of F. So if you don't know what this is, don't worry about this, but if you have taken any course on algebraic number theory, you will have heard that the class group tells you a lot about the arithmetic of the uh, number field F uh, or of this ring. So for example, if we have uh, this square root of minus five thing, this class group would be Z mod two. So there you have an example where you have some element which is not just in this Z summit. 
Okay. So, so this is a definition which uh, you can do and which you can use for a variety of reasons. You see that uh, you recover some important invariant in number theory by this. You can also use it, for example, uh, if you have just any ring and you want to study modules over this, this might be hard, for even projective modules, but you want to simplify this theory. It might be a group ring, for example. Uh, this might be an example where uh, the modules uh, would be representations then. Or you might uh, have more geometric perspective and your ring might be um, some uh, ring of functions on some algebraic variety then uh, this projective modules, if this variety is affine, would be uh, vector bundles on this. So you have some algebraic vector bundles. So this was like the original motivation of Golden D to consider this, to prove his uh, riemann roch theorem. Okay, so there are a variety of reasons why we might study this. But uh, actually the story does not end there. So there are higher K groups as well. So, uh, so uh, Bas and Shan will define K1 of a ring. And actually this is uh, related uh, to work of Whitehead. Uh, there's a so-called Whitehead group of a, uh, of a group ring, of a group, uh, which plays a huge role in high dimensional topology, topology of high dimensional manifolds. And this is uh, very much related to K1 of a group ring. So this, I think, is where Bas and Shano were motivated from to make the definitions. And, and then and they also discovered that uh, there are some exact sequences. So they exist. Exact sequences relating K0 of R and K1 of R, but then they end. So you have some exact sequence, but at some point it just stops. You would kind of like to continue to a long exact sequence, but at some point it just stops. So if you have something of K0 and K1 and then just stops, you might say, oh, there should be higher K groups as well, K2, K3, and so on, which you can consider, kind of continue the exact sequence to get a long exact sequence. So uh, it's a little bit like with homology, if we only knew kind of H0 and H1, and uh, but you would kind of see that your Maya Vitova sequence should really involve higher homology groups. And the situation was similar for K theory. So uh, this, this, this situation quite, quite for higher K groups. And then uh, a rather complicated history at the end of the 60s begins with different people suggesting different definitions of higher K groups. So, um, so Milner defined uh, K2, then Swan uh, defined K3 of a, a ring and actually also proposed a definition of higher algebraic K th groups, but he couldn't really do anything uh, with this. And then uh, the most important work is by Quillen who uh, defined all higher Ki. And then the particular approach uh, I want to say a little bit about this in a few minutes, I think is due to Siegel, although I'm not sure about the precise history. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot to say even about this lower kind of this say K2. So for example, uh, Wilbert, uh, I, kind of when I looked through history, I also saw Wilbert's name kind of providing some of the early calculations of K2 here. Okay. But let me say a little bit how one defines this higher algebraic K groups, because I think uh, it's quite an interesting story. So how to define Ki of a ring. So the idea is don't only Consider isomorphism classes projective modules but 
also the isomorphisms between them. So more precisely, uh, we can look at the category, which I call a uh, fancy approach R. whose objects are projective R modules, finitely generated. So it's a curious feature of the whole theory. If you don't restrict to finitely generated one, you will always get zero as your K theory groups, uh, but don't want to talk about this. And the morphisms are just isomorphisms between them. So R linear isomorphisms between them. And there's a construction called the classifying space. Usually denoted by B. So this is a functor going from categories to topological spaces. So to each category uh, with a set of objects, I can associate a topological space in a functorial manner. I don't want to give the definition of this uh, classifying space construction, but I just want to give one or two examples to illustrate this. So um, I can view, if I have a group G, I can view it as a category uh, where I have one object and the group G are the morphisms uh, relating the object to itself. I take the classifying space of this. This is called BG. Uh, this has the property that uh, if I look at homotopy classes from some space X into BG, then this is same as principal G bundles or isomorphism class of principal G bundles on X. So, Specializing further, I could say I took take G equal GLNC. And there's a slight subtle point. Uh, I want to remember its topology here. So I don't only want to consider it as a group, but of course the complex numbers have a topology and I want to remember this here. And I can incorporate this into this classifying space uh, business. Uh, then, BGLNC classifies principal GLNC bundles by what I just said. But uh, this is uh, the same up to isomorphism as n dimensional complex vector bundles. So you get a space which is also homotopy equivalent to this Grassmannians. Okay, so you see this classifying space construction is in general a useful thing to do. So I might also just apply this to uh, to this category here. And actually up to equivalence, this will be a disjoint union of classifying space of groups uh, if you think a little bit about this. Okay. So, now we have a space, but we need a little bit of extra structure. So, uh, so the direct sum uh, is a monoidal, defines a monoidal structure. On this, because I have two projective modules, I can just sum them. Um, and I don't want to define precisely what a monoid structure is, but it's like a monoid, but uh, you put it on a category. So if you have two things, you can you can sum them. And it's uh, almost associative and commutative. 
So why do I write almost? Well, if I have two modules, uh, M and N, or let's call this E and F, this is isomorphic to F plus E, but it's not really equal to it. So it's it's not really commutative because this would only be two equal, but it's almost commutative in the sense that they are related by canonical isomorphism, which also satisfies some conditions. So, and if one thinks about this, this will imply that this thing uh, uh, gets a product from this, or gets a kind of uh, monoidal structure. which is also uh, almost associative and commutative. So I should say this is, uh, so topologists have uh, long studied uh, this kind of having a pro some kind of product on a space which is not quite associative and not quite commutative, but certainly up to homotopy it will be commutative up to some preferred homotopy, which satisfies some higher conditions and so on and so on. So it's a little bit difficult to set up precisely, but uh, the idea is hopefully clear. And, uh, and this is called an E infinity space. It's a bit like if you have the loop space of a space, so you can compose loops, but it's not quite associative because you have to rescale to make them kind of of length one again. Okay, so, so E infinity space is the analogon of what we had before considering the Belian monoid, uh, which was Proch, the non-fancy Proch R. So now we beefed it up to a space version, which is not quite commutative, but almost, and this is called this E infinity space. And it turns out that you can also apply group completion to the E infinity spaces. And uh, the definition is, so the algebraic K-theory space K of R of uh, R is the group completion. of the infinity space B fancy approach of R. So this thing would be what we might call an E infinity group instead of an E infinity space or E infinity monoid. And then one defines Ki of R to be the ith homotopy group of this space. So uh, we call here that uh, the ithomotopy groups just means I take pointed maps, pointed homotopy classes from the i dimensional sphere to k of r. Okay. So yeah, I find this uh, definition quite beautiful in the sense that you get these higher k groups not by just some ad hoc measures, but in some sense you do exactly the same thing you did before for k zero, but you try to be just a little bit more fancy. You don't forget the isomorphisms, you just remember them and record everything in a space. And then you just say, what is the correct structure? What is like an abelian monad on a space? You record it in this notion of infinity space. You find what group completion means here, which is not obvious how to do it, but you can do it. And then you just take the homotopy groups. So, so there's some really kind of brilliant ideas by Quill and Siegel behind this. So are there any questions about this? Okay, apparently not. And then the question of course is how can you actually calculate these groups? And the answer is it's extremely hard. So K1 is often quite doable. K2 is already can be pretty difficult. 
but uh, and then it's even hard to calculate all of them, but actually in some examples you can do it. And uh, this was also one of the strengths of Quillen's work, that he couldn't only provide general definitions and abstract properties, he could actually calculate some examples. So about the simplest ring you could imagine is FP, uh, the field with uh, P elements, and uh, we already saw that we get the integers if i is zero. And but Quillen could also calculate the other groups. So it's uh, zero p to j minus one if i is odd, and zero if uh, i bigger than zero is even. So the exact values are maybe not so important, except we will kind of later uh, use that. Uh, actually, uh, this is prime to p, this uh, the order of this group. But yeah. And uh, just for illustration, I was uh, want to also give an, uh, another thing that um, maybe I just do it in the case of z. So it's related. Uh, to Bernoulli numbers. So for example, uh, one can, so uh, for example, one can say that uh, if I take the order, so the higher K groups are of uh, Z, uh, many of them are finite. So every fourth one is not finite, but many of them is finite. And then there's a formula which says the following, that this thing is the same as the value of the Riemann zeta function at one minus two K. So, uh, yeah, this I just want to mention, this can be, there's a formula for this in terms of Bernoulli numbers. So this is related to this kind of famous thing that the sum over the reciprocal square numbers is pi squared over six. And there's some functional equation uh, relating the um, positive zeta values with negative ones and can be expressed in Bernoulli numbers. And then the funny thing is, or the interesting thing that these K groups also are related to this. And this uh, relationship actually not only true for the integers, but for any number ring, uh, there's a statement here where you would kind of put the Dedekind zeta function. And this is a very deep theorem. Uh, so uh, at least the general, at least the general version uses deep results uh, by uh, so by Andrew Wiles and uh, by Wojewodski. Host and was uh, conjectured already pretty early in the days uh, by Lichtenbaum. Okay. So these kind of K groups really kind of package us some arithmetic information. So even the higher ones. So I want to give uh, one more example. So uh, I want to speak about K theory of the complex numbers. So you might think this is related to top uh, topological K theory. So uh, it turns out this is not I mean, it's related, this is certainly true, but the relationship is a little bit more subtle than one might think. So uh, uh, doesn't quite match. Unless we remember uh, the topologies. So what do I mean by this? When I look at proj C, well, what are complex, what are projective modules of the complex numbers? So just C to the N. So the category I consider as I have here C to the zero, 
c to the one, c to the two, and so on. Uh, up to isomorphism, this is everything. And uh, what is the automorphism group? Well, it's just my GLNC. So uh, the classifying space of this is actually homotopy equivalent to disjoint union of BGLNC. Now, if I do algebraic K theory with the general construction, I would just uh, view GLNC as discrete groups because for the general ring, I wouldn't know what other topology put on this. But it turns out if I remember the topology, then I get something which is closely related to uh, topological K theory, which may be not uh, so surprising because these things really classify n dimensional vector bundles, as I uh, discussed earlier. So if I remember, uh, if I remember um, the topology, uh, I might get something, the group completion would be something I might call uh, K topological of C. Then it turns out that the multiple groups of this thing are just Z in every second degree. And note, it's the same answer as if I take uh, K zero uh, of S I. I guess, uh, strictly speaking, I should take the reduced K theory, but uh, let's leave this aside. So this clearly has something to do uh, with, uh, with topological K theory. So this is uh, bot periodicity. So this is essentially, it's a two periodic theory. So I have Z in every even degree, only that this K theory groups are only defined in, uh, in non-negative degrees. But now, uh, uh, but now I can say the following. So um, in topology, one considers uh, two periodic K theory groups. So uh, actually we have this Ki of X and they are the same as Ki plus two of X. So this is what comes up in topology. So we might want to, have, and this is also true for all degrees, uh, also for negative degrees. We might try to do something also similar here. So we can just do the most naive thing. So we can just take beta in K2 top of C to be a generator and get a periodic K theory by just taking, uh, by just inverting this beta. Okay. So this is just something we could do and then this would be uh, just uh, Laurent polynomials. Okay. And this would even fit better um, the K theory groups. Uh, so then we would get that uh, this is the same thing as taking the K theory groups of a point in topology. So this is a little bit of motivation why we might want to do something like this. Okay, are there any questions about this part? Okay, so uh, this way I gave in some sense an ad hoc construction how I could in one single example do something like periodic algebraic K theory. I make a computation then I said I identify a specific elements and I can invert it. But of course, this doesn't say that I can do it in general. So is there a general analog? Uh, so some beta in K2 of a ring R, so I can get uh, a periodic uh, K theory of R which would be K star R with beta inverted. Oops. 
So, and the answer is uh, not quite, but almost. So, so this is some insights going back uh, to Adams uh, and then apply to K-theory, to Snaith and uh, Thomason, especially. So Thomason really proved the crucial theorems about this. So it turns out there's actually something I can do for every infinity group. So for every infinity group, like this K of R I dis uh, discussed earlier, there is an operator beta going from the i homotopy group, and I will add something in a moment here to um, the uh, i plus degree of beta uh, homotopy group. So this degree of beta doesn't need to be two. It could be two, like in the example I had here, where I could just multiply with the element degree two, but it could also be a higher degree. I will come back to this later. But actually, I have to quotient by P here. So like a usual commutative group, I can quotient by P. I can also do this for an E infinity group. And the kind of miracle is that then suddenly I can, my, so to speak, multiply with beta after I quotient out by P, else this would be not possible. So such that for uh, E equaling this topological K theory above, uh, this equals multiplication with the power of uh, this beta. So I'm slightly abusing notation because it's not equal with multiplication of beta, but just with the power. But for the purposes of inverting something, it doesn't matter if I uh, invert an element itself or power of it. And actually, uh, I can also, uh, I don't have to quotient over P, I can also quotient over P to the K. So this, this operator will change a little bit, this degree of beta, for example, but I can also do this. Is your P arbitrary prime? Uh, yes. It can be two when you're asking this. Okay, so uh, then I can def uh, make a definition. I can say uh, K star periodic of R and I put a Z mod P to the K here is I take this quotient, then I have this operator beta, uh, which I can invert. So I force, I kind of make the minimal construction which forces uh, this multiplication by some power of beta to be an isomorphism. And actually uh, I can go to the limit and get something which uh, one might call a periodic uh, K theory with coefficients in ZP. So this is quite misnomer because in general, it won't be periodic anymore because uh, in any sense, because this degree of beta grows with K, but let's just ignore this for a moment. Okay. Leonard, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so if you scroll up a little bit, um, so if P is equal to two, then this has something to do with uh, K theory of orthogonal bundles, right? In geometric settings. Uh, uh, why? Well, I've seen constructions where uh, you join half and then, so if you have the Euler class of an orthogonal bundle, it's a square, so you can take a square root and you can do similar operations than in K theory. And then I've seen people adjoining a half, or what, but I, I don't know if that's related to this. Okay. so. Okay, I'm not quite sure whether, so um, 
Okay, so one reason why often people join one half in context of uh, kind of taking KT of real bundles or orthogonal bundles is because uh, if you um, invert two, then uh, complex and real K3 become extremely similar. So uh, real K3 becomes a sum of complex K3 uh, once you invert two everywhere. So in some sense, uh, this makes it much easier to study. So maybe this is something you're referring to, I'm not quite sure. But it's a different inverting uh, process than what I'm doing here because uh, this kind of inverting this kind of kind of board element has nothing special to do with kind of anything orthogonal. Okay. There might be the difference between an involution in algebra and one in topology. Right, so I mean, uh, right. I mean, of course the relationship between complex and weak K theory is very much governed by the uh, involution of uh, complex conjugation. But yeah, as I said, this I think is a little bit different story because these are not really involutions. Uh, more questions? Okay. So I should give at least one example of this, although it would be a very boring example. So So what is the periodic uh, K theory of FP. Well, let me scroll up a little bit. So these were the homotopy groups of K of FP. So, so it's not quite true that if I quotient out by P in the infinity group, it's just taking the quotient modulo P of the groups. So it's more like the universal coefficient theorem in topology. So you have one quotient group and the other, you take the P torsion from the next group. But this doesn't really matter here. The kind of point is that uh, these groups will be completely killed because the uh, torsion respect to a number which is not divisible by P. So what does it mean is that if I take pi star of K of FP modulo P, this would be just uh, uh, Z mod P if star is zero and zero else. Now uh, this element beta, which I invert has positive degree. So uh, if it goes from zero to somewhere it can only land in zero. And if I force it to be an isomorphism, well, then I force everything to be zero. Okay. So I have at least one example. Okay, so this is of course, uh, in some sense, a boring example, but I want to give you also a different theorem, which uh, lies much deeper. So it says if R is nice, so in particular commutative and uh, important thing, P must be invertible in R. So it could be the rational numbers, it could be kind of any field of characteristic zero, for example, or of characteristic not P. So then, can do two things. I can look at the ith k group of R and I can complete it at P. So, uh, so for example, if it were the integers, then I get the p adic integers there. Or if I get uh, Z mod, say the k group would be Z mod P, then it just stays Z mod P. So this would be some examples of this operation. And I can map it into the periodic K theory. And this is an ISO for I uh, sufficiently large. And actually uh, sufficiently large is not very large in general. So e.g. for I bigger than zero, uh, if uh, R is very nice, namely this ring here. So this says in general, if P is invertible and R is not too bad, then these periodic K-theory groups actually see a tremendous amount of the usual K-theory groups. Because we might hope the low dimensional ones you can calculate by hand and the high dimensional ones we can then relate to this thing, which actually has much better properties than usual K theory. So, and I should also say, this is also reliant on the work of Thomason. Uh, and uh, 
especially on the block carter conjecture avoid skin rost there's a nice write up of this i mean they add quite a bit to the story let's say uh, by uh, by Klausen and matthew so then was the question what happens if r of p is not invertible like in uh, for this poor guy fp uh, which was completely destroyed by taking periodic k theory well uh, this is one theorem I want to mention. So it was originally proven by uh, Bud, Klaus, and Matthew. And then it was reproven by a completely different means uh, in work with uh, Marcus Lund, Aki Matthew, and uh, Georg Tamer. That actually periodic k theory doesn't see the difference if I invert p. So this explains why this uh, condition here was completely necessary in the theorem above, because the usual k theory is very sensitive to changing things like inverting p. And but this guy uh, doesn't see the difference. And actually, this implies uh, all right, Leonard, is the theorem that that map is an equivalence? Nice. Oh, yes, thank you. It's an isomorphism. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, this implies uh, many other properties. For example, uh, that uh, if I take the periodic K theory of R, it's the same as. Uh, Of a polynomial ring in R, so uh, this is known for a usual K theory if the ring is like very nice, like regular, but uh, here it holds in complete generality. And we can also, I mean, do some kind of trivial computations with this. For example, say we have uh, Z mod P to the K. This must be zero because uh, our theorem shows that, or I guess Bud Klaus and Matthew's theorem shows that this is the same as the K theory of the zero ring. And uh, regardless what you know about computation of K theory, uh, you might guess the K theory of the zero ring is zero. And actually, this is an interesting example because the K usual K theory groups of this ring are not known except in very low degrees. So question at this point. Um, does the I in your um, in your theorem above by Thomason, um, does that have anything to do with R? Like it's crude yes. dimension or something? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's more complicated than the cool dimension. It's about some uh, virtual cohomological dimensions of Galois groups of residue fields and stuff like this. But uh, yeah, so it has certainly something to do with R. Okay, it does seem more complicated. Mm -hmm. So then I want to give a short outlook uh, on what else we do. And I will be even more sketchy and vague than before. And this, sorry, uh, this will be uh, just called higher periodicities. So, So in every group, I can multiply an element by P in every abelian group. And I also explained above that, uh, let me scroll up for a moment, that if I have any infinity group, if I mod out by P, then I can multiply by some beta to get these operators. Well, it turns out that these two things are just the first two in a whole row of operators. Are uh, the first two. And a whole sequence of operators. Mm 
0, v1, v2, v3, and so on. So eg, if uh, e is an e-infinity group, I said I can model by p, and before I inverted beta. But actually, there's also a process which says, OK, I just do the opposite. So it's like um, when I have a usual abelian group, I can invert p. This means I kill every p torsion. But I can also quotient by p. This will throw out all the kind of q summons or something like this I have. But I really remember the p torsion. And there's a process where I can also quotient by beta here. But then I can invert the next guy, which would be v2. So there's a new operator appearing once I kill beta. Actually, I could also repeat. I could kill B, P, beta, V2, and then I can invert V3. So there are all these kind of operators. So this is actually part of chromatic homotopy theory. So uh, the bad news is this was uh, bad news proven by Mitchell that uh, if E is uh, K of R, where this is a ring, then this construction gives zero. So there are no higher periodicities in algebraic K theory, at least not in algebraic K theory of usual rings. So but R, uh, this, uh, so, so commutative, Rings are just examples of a notion in topology called E infinity rings. So I talked before about E infinity groups. Actually, I can also have a second operation on them, giving the notion of an E infinity ring. And the commutative ring would be just an example where I have a discrete E infinity ring. And I can uh, take K theory of an E infinity ring. Okay, this uh, might uh, sound like an exercise in uh, doing uh, using uh, the fanciest possible uh, words, uh, but actually it turns out that this is related. Uh, so Waldhausen introduced this. To study high dimensional manifolds. So I said much earlier that K theory, the first K theory of a group ring is related to uh, so-called escobordism theorem in uh, geometric topology. And there are refinements of the escobordism theorem by Waldhausen and uh, Rockens and Jahren, uh, which replace this K1 of a group ring by a whole K theory space of certain e infinity rings. So I don't, really don't want to go into the details here, but just to give you an illustration why one might do this. And then the theorem, which I will only state in very vague terms. So this is uh, by uh, this work with uh, Lund, uh, Matthew, and Tamer. Actually, uh, for time reasons, I only write the initials. We are kind of heavily depend on some other work by Clausen, Matthew, Naumann, and Noel that taking uh, the K theory of R and uh, doing this kind of construction, we quotient out by all the lower operators and then invert Vn. It's only dependent on doing the same thing with R and also doing the same thing with R, but only going to n minus two level. Sorry, n minus one level here. So it's not really dependent on R and self anymore, but just on these two guys. So this is slightly vague version of, uh, of the theorem we proved. And I'm running out of time, but uh, I don't uh, assume that uh, kind of you understand the details of this, but I just want to give uh, illustrate how this uh, generalizes our earlier theorem. So example, are usual 
ring, so nothing of these uh, fancy infinity rings. So, and let's take n equals one. So then this uh, k r mod p v1 inverted, it's just the same thing what I earlier denoted k periodic of r uh, with z mod p coefficients. So the thing uh, which uh, this earlier theorem uh, here was about. So then, so if I have R, so this uh, then all, this only depends on R mod P with V1 inverted and on R, okay. Now I have to kind of, uh, so if N is one, I don't quotient out by anything here and I just invert V0. And V0 in my dictionary above was just P. Okay. Just depends on these two guys. And it turns out that kind of inverting V1 in a discrete guy completely kills it. So this is just zero. So it doesn't add any information. So our theorem then says that uh, the periodic K theory only depends on R with one over, uh, with P inverted, which was, uh, if I let me scroll up for a moment again which was precisely uh, what we said here. And, uh, but the nice thing is that we can kind of do this for every N, uh, which is uh, kind of nice to discuss some other examples, which I really don't have time to go into. Okay. So I think this is everything I wanted to say. Okay, then let's thank Leonard. Thanks for the talk.